Well, I think uh, we? it's uh, 101, so we can slowly uh -huh. start. Start. Um, Hi, Bill. Melissa is asking if hey. we know each other. <laughs> yes, we do, indeed. It's, uh, it's good to see you, Jim. Yeah. Okay, great. So we have all the panelists and people are coming in. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Elzbieta Falerkitu. I'm the Assistant Director of the Trebaya Center for Historical Studies. Our director, Jonathan Glassman, unfortunately could not be with us today. So I have the great pleasure of welcoming everyone. Uh, welcome to this event, which is a uh, part of a whole series of Zoom meetings and webinars uh, and organized by the center instead of our usual annual lunch lectures by eminent guest speakers. So instead of feeding you lunch, we, we can't feed you lunch, but we can uh, provide food for thought. Uh, this is the second day of the virtual visit of our distinguished guest, James Millward of Georgetown University, a historian of China. After today, we have one more central event to look forward to, and this is in the fall quarter, and this is on November 19th. It is our annual collaboration with the Holocaust Education Foundation at Northwestern. Erin <clears throat> uh, McLaughlin of Washington University, St. Louis, will speak about Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and the film's outtakes. So it's an interesting project to look at what was not included in the film and what that can tell us. Uh, this year's center events are being recorded and can be seen on the center website at historicalstudies.northwestern.edu. And again this year, because it's such a special and unusual and challenging year, Chabraya Center events are being included in a history department series called Historians at Home, since we're all working from home. And these include roundtables and panels on uh, a variety of newsworthy topics, such as pandemics or policing. And details of these can be found on the history department website and also on the center <coughs> website. Now, today, Professor Millward will be joined in conversation by two Northwestern scholars of Southeast Asia, Peter Carroll from the History Department and William Hurst from the Department of Political Science. Professor Hurst is the author of The Chinese Worker After Socialism. And so as the title suggests, he works on labor politics, political economy, and the politics of law in Southeast Asia. He is currently completing a book manuscript on the comparative politics of law and legal institutions in China and Indonesia after, uh, since 1949. Professor Carroll specializes in the social and cultural history of 19th and 20th century China. His award-winning book, Between Heaven and Modernity, Reconstruction, Suzhou, 1895, 1937, has been recently translated into Chinese. He is now working on a book project on suicide and ideas of modern society in China during the first half of the 20th century. Very glad to have you both here with us. And now Professor Carroll has the pleasant task of introducing our guest speaker. Peter. Well, thank you very much. So welcome all to what is officially titled A Conversation on the Crisis in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, our speaker, as Elzbieta has already indicated, is James Millward, who is the Professor of Intersocietal History at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, uh, where he teaches Chinese, Central Asian, and world um, history. Um, some of you um, may have heard um, the conversation um, yesterday. Uh, and so um, you'll know of, you know, his um, main works, I would say, um, which are Beyond the Past, Economy, Ethnicity, and Empire in Qing Central Asia, um, as well as um, the Eurasian Crossroads, A History of Xinjiang, um, you know, and several other, um, you know, significant works. Although I must say, I am most looking forward to um, a book that we were just talking about that he's been contemplating for a while, you know, which is um, looking at Eurasian lutes and music, you know, in world history. Uh, so the plan is uh, for Professor Millward 
uh, to first um, speak on this topic for some 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and then Professor Hurst and I um, will, you know, each ask a questions, we'll, 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 we'll take turns. Um, this is a webinar, uh, but certainly uh, those of you um, who are watching are encouraged to ask questions. So if you wish to do so, I'll keep track of this. Uh, please submit them on the, you know, Q&A tab, which is at, you know, the bottom, you know, of your screen. Uh, so, uh, Professor Millward, you know, please, um, welcome to Northwestern yet again. You're muted. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, and I'm going to share a screen with a PowerPoint for everybody. Uh, okay. And that should be, it should be there. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm here. I would very much like to be speaking about uh, Silk Road Music, Musical Instrument Exchange, that's, that's a more fun topic, unfortunately. Uh, you know, events dictate that uh, I'd be talking about, about Xinjiang, about what's going on there. Uh, I'm going to assume today that most of us who have, who have tuned in are more or less aware of you know, what has been going on. I'll do a quick summary of, of those things. But my main point today will be to try to lay out an argument uh, or, or to look at some of the history of it and, and, and see how we got to where we are today. And as you can see, I'll be talking both about development and assimilation. Uh, and this is a you know, very brief sort of summary approach um, in just 20 minutes. And so we have more time for discussion and conversation uh, as well. But it's a rendering down of a chapter that I added to my book, Eurasian Crossroads, which is a general survey of the Xinjiang region and, and I was asked to do a second edition and so over the summer I sat back and I had to look at the period of time since around 2005 uh, to the to the present and so that exercise was really quite quite interesting so this is again kind of a distillation of some of that you know, thinking and writing that I did uh, over the summer okay so again as as pretty much everyone here I assume knows uh, since around 2017, there have been reports coming both uh, you know, from, from Uyghurs themselves, from visitors to the Xinjiang or, or the Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, by, by reporters, from scholars, about the erection of a very systematic and in some ways kind of frightening surveillance regime uh, that involves, of course, lots of facial recognition cameras. It involves uh, grid policing, a lot of boots on the ground, about 100,000 new deputy police were hired to, to implement this. Uh, but also a very uh, in, in, intrusive approach to information on cell phones. So with apps that can read and report everything on that with, with, uh, with, with technology that's able to sniff phones. Uh, and so, and a gathering of all kinds of you know, digital data like this, and then also bio data. Uh, uh, people were required to have physical examinations. Uh, DNA has been collected. Their irises have been scanned. Uh, their gait in some places has been measured through 360 photography and so on and so forth. All of that data put together in a, into a platform uh, called the Joint Operations Military Platform. Uh, which is able to uh, make that information available and also uh, mobilize it in real time so that as you move around uh, in, in Xinjiang, as a facial recognition picks you up, as your iris is scanned, uh, as perhaps a policeman stops and asks for your ID, uh, those movements also go into the database and authorities have access to that whole, that whole database. Another thing which that database was used for through algorithms, well, it, it, it worked as a kind of scoring system, um, somewhat like the social social credit score. Um, so with, with, with numerical values associated with uh, whether you had traveled or whether you have, you have relatives who traveled, how religious you are, whether you pray, whether your relatives pray, uh, any, any previous run-ins with the law, 
uh, all sorts of information like that all put together. And then when the algorithms crunch, uh, a score came out that rates people uh, as, as normal uh, or as, as dangerous. Uh, and, 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 and as a result of that, and a couple levels of, of, of concern, security concern. And as a result of that, um, something like a million to two million people were moved into the internment camps that we've heard about uh, or into prisons for educational transformation, Jiao Yu Zhuan Hua, as it's known, uh, which as we know from leaked documents and personal accounts were for the most part very punitive prison-like uh, prison -like, like systems. At the same time, the family planning laws have been very, very robustly enforced uh, in the Xinjiang region, in particular in southern Xinjiang, which is primarily Uyghur, uh, even as they are relaxed uh, and there are even pro-natal policies in other parts of China. Uh, and we know we have statistics that have come out both from county level uh, and then broader, broader levels about, for example, sterilizations, about insertions of IUDs. And just one example is something like 80% uh, of all the IUDs inserted in China uh, in 2018 were inserted in Xinjiang, which has 1.5% of the population. So again, a very, very uh, sort of muscular efforts to uh, assert this kind of thing. And people, women were put into camps for having above quota children, which is more than three children. Uh, more recently, there seems to have been a quote unquote graduation from the camps of, uh, of, of some people. It's not clear exactly how many people remain in the camps and how many have been, have been moved out, but we know that uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of people uh, have moved or are, are now working in uh, factories either adjacent to or inside the precincts of the camps. Uh, in satellite factories in uh, villages of southern Xinjiang or in other parts of Xinjiang, maybe hundreds of kilometers away from their home, or in eastern China through labor uh, uh, transfer uh, programs. And uh, there's, of course, controversy and debate over the, the nature of that labor, whether it is uh, non-free or non-voluntary, but it's quite clear that under the circumstances where these camps exist, and where such a large proportion of the uh, Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, and other Nanahan population in Xinjiang has been put into them, one cannot say no to a campaign that is that is telling you to go and work in this and work in this factory. So this is really amounting to, particularly for the, uh, for the farming population in southern Xinjiang, uh, this is amounting really to a prole proletarianization of Uyghur farm labor. Uh, moving them into factories. And I'll talk more about that uh, later on. Uh, there have been other attacks on the family, in particular, simply all of these policies that I've just mentioned have the result of separating families. And this, we've, we've seen this reflected in a much lower birth rate uh, in the, in the, among the Uyghur populations uh, over the last few years. Uh, but there's also been a, an official campaign encouraging Han Uyghur marriage, uh, which one might think is well, okay, certainly, you know, we're not opposed to uh, inter-ethnic marriage uh, as a moral as a moral question, uh, but recently a new a law was passed that declared uh, parental opposition to a marriage uh, was declared an extremist act. Uh, and so, if a father doesn't want his daughter marrying uh, someone else, or marrying a Han, uh, that has been declared publicly to be extremism, which of course the punishment for extremism is a stint in these, in these camps. All of this is against the backdrop of a ongoing assault on Uyghur culture and, and, and cultural heritage. that's really been going on for a decade or more in, in many ways. And we'll see some images of that. So I'm gonna argue that these new policies, this new assimilation, this push is a disjuncture from the past in scale uh, and in, in its intensity, uh, uh, but in a way also kind of follows some of those some of those trajectories. Um, and so it, it is, you know, it's both coming out of uh, an assimilationist tendency that has been there, 
but has really gone you know, full, full bore in an assimilationist direction. And in this, it, it is a disjuncture from previous ethnicity policies. Uh, but at the same time, it also comprises a kind of a merging of ethnicity and development policies in the region. All right, so, so, so very, very quickly, uh, just um, if I, I've given this kind of talk for a long, uh, um, you know, for a couple of years now, and there is often questions about the data and the evidence and so on. Um, so I don't have time to run through it all, but you know, just quickly, we can see here, this is from public source materials, uh, and it shows the sudden uptick in 2017 of people going through the legal system. This is not the camps, this is into prison. An increase of about 200,000 in 2017 and uh, over 300,000 in 2018 going into the, the, the prison systems. Some 20, over 20% 20 of all people prosecuted in China uh, in those years were prosecuted in Xinjiang. Again, Xinjiang has only one and a half percent of the population. So there's a, you know, 2017, 2018, that corresponds with this huge uptick in the building of security facilities, mainly the camps that we've, that we've talked about. And this has been noted from satellite data and also public documents. This is Khotan, one prefecture in the south, but you see in those same years, this rather chilling uptick in the building of kindergartens. So Yoaria, and this includes it's younger than kindergartens in America. It includes kids as young as 18 months, sometimes younger than that. Uh, and these are also you know, boarding institutions sometimes. So this is where the children go when their parents are sent away to the camps. Uh, this is a more recent uh, publication. This just came out from The Economist, I think, last, last week. They've gathered uh, this data. Um, same kind of story, students, dorms, and boarding schools, but, but grades one through nine. Again, in the same years, and actually starting a little earlier, rapidly upticking. So there's clearly a policy to uh, to raise children in state institutions in Chinese. Uh, and uh, Peter may have a comment on on these kind of things later. But um, for several years, there's been a disappearance of of mosques, of shrines, uh, destruction of those buildings, or of certain architectural elements of them, in particular domes. And again, we've noted all this from satellite photography, you know, Google Earth archived images compared side by side with more recent images. And you see you know, them disappearing like that over time. And of course, old Kashgar, through a combination of development initiatives, uh, which even the People's Daily noted uh, could not be said to be free of corruption on the part of local developers and local authorities. The old city of Kashgar has been being carried down from the early 2000s uh, and a somewhat dis and a disnified version of it put up in its place uh, as, a, as a tourist site. Um, this picture shows up in tons of tourists photos. I think everybody has a, uh, you know, has a, has a photo op there, if not a dinner. Uh, the McKinsey Corporation, uh, the, the management consultant firm, had their December 2018 uh, uh, retreat for their Asia operations in Kashgar, uh, right in front of this. Uh, for, the, for those historians here, particularly the Qing historians, I think it's interesting how we have, of course, you know, the, the singing and dancing, which Uyghurs are always portrayed, portrayed doing, uh, with musicians up on the, on the right, and, and of course the dancing women here. Uh, but we have people dressed up as bannermen, um, we've got five of the eight Qing banners there. So it, it is an entirely, and, and a fake Great Wall. So it is a imperial tableau that has been recreated here. There's been significant pressure on Uyghur language, in particular on, on, on Arabic script. Uyghur is written in a modified Arabic alphabet, generally. Uh, this is a banner outside of a school, and you can see, you know, it says in Romanization, Nin Hao, and then the Chinese for that, and then Yaksham Sis, which means the same thing, hello, in a respectful way, um, in Romanization. But the Uyghur has been cut out of this banner with a razor. Uh, 
And that kind of erasure is going on for religious buildings in many places as well. Some of you may have read about the uh, anti-halal move or, or, or campaign uh, concern about it. And so the, the, the word halal when written in Arabic script has been erased from restaurant windows, not only in Xinjiang, but in Northwest China and elsewhere. Prohibition of, of, of public prayer, and of course has been uh, now essentially an illegal, illegalization of women wearing face coverings, of young men wearing beards. Started out as a campaign of discouragement, and now it's essentially, you know, those uh, decisions will get you put into camps. And then I just wanted to put up this image of some of our, our colleagues. Um, there's in the PRC propaganda a common uh, argument that the people that they have been putting into camps and putting into and, and sort of disappearing uh, are, are, are uneducated peasants, right? Who need to learn Chinese, who need to learn the law. But among the first people who disappeared were scholars, artists, publishers, the president of Xinjiang University, uh, and others like there's a list of some 400 that has been uh, gathered of you know, the elites, the cultural and economic and political and commercial elites of Uyghur society have been disappeared. Uh, all right, conscious of my, of my time, which is quickly going away. Um, so I'm arguing that it's not a terrorism problem or a separatism problem or an extremism problem that the Chinese Communist Party faces in the Uyghur region, um, but rather a colonial, a colonial problem. Uh, and there are some, some different dimensions of that. Heteronomy, and barring a word that Gardner Bovington used here, the opposite of autonomy, but you know, ruling over somebody else, other, uh, other kinds of people in a distant space like this, uh, is expensive. It has financial and legitimacy uh, costs. Uh, when there is resistance, as there has been, and I'll talk about this uh, later on, uh, repression in and of itself elicits more resistance, which in turn elicits repression. And this is really what's been going on since the 1990s with the ratcheting up of strike hard campaigns uh, and different kinds of, of, of responses uh, to that. And of course, the historicist arguments that you know, the region is Chinese don't actually help with the practical problems of, of governance under these kinds of situations. So there have been a couple of trajectories of policy which do attempt to uh, address this. Uh, development, of course, is very, very important in, in, and has been for decades in how the PRC approaches, approaches Xinjiang. Uh, and this fits with the Marxist idea that you know, national differences are essentially uh, you know, ideological, uh, they're, they're in, the, in the superstructure, and that they will disappear with material changes, right, of, of the, the means and mode of production and, and so on. Uh, and it also more or less fits with uh, you know, general global approaches uh, to development and China's own economic uh, uh, policies. And so, so that has been going on. Uh, as I'll mention in a moment, though, a big part of that development effort has been settler colonialism, so moving more Han out there. And, and a lot of the development of extractive industries, of, of industry in general, of, of agriculture, has been for the benefit of newly arrived Han colonists, in particular, uh, those brought in and managed by the, the Xinjiang Production Construction Corps, or the Bing Tuan. At the same time, the other stream of policies, there are for diversity management, ethnicity policies. Uh, and these have swung back and forth, really, between more pluralist approaches, uh, particularly culturally, uh, and then also assimilationist. And right now we're in a, in a more assimilationist mode than we have been even, I think, more than during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, so I won't go through the whole, the whole history of this, um, of, of the region, uh, but just kind of glancing over the decades like this, uh, there wasn't much development done uh, uh, for the first several decades of the PRC. Uh, for the first 10 years, it was sort of linked to the USSR. Um, USS, the Soviets were still uh, mining uh, and, and 
and developing oil resources and so on in the region. That, of course, ended with the Sino-Soviet split. For the next 20 or more than 20 years, not much happened uh, there in terms of development. The rail line from Lanzhou in Gansu province to Urumqi uh, was built in the 60s. It was a great leap forward project, but it was, it was pushed out it was a single line which means that you can't have trains going in two different directions at the same time. Um, you have to pull off on a siding and wait for the train to come. And I, I rode on that train and sometimes you wait for hours and hours before the next steam train comes along through the desert. Uh, so that's just an indication. And then, you know, only in 1999 was a, a rail link extended to, to Kashgar. So that shows you how it was really kind of left out of, of the development calculus for a long time. And then, of course, the great development of the West included Xinjiang along with Sichuan and, and Gansu and other inward, inland-lying parts of, of China. Uh, critiques done, you know, after 2010 by, by Chinese scholars, uh, as well as Western scholars, uh, have noted that most of those big projects carried out under the Shibu Dakaifa, under the, the development of the West program, involved resource extraction, transportation infrastructure, which was beneficial for everyone, uh, but very little human development, and particularly tended to kind of skipped the poor southern part of, of Xinjiang. From 2010, after the Urumqi uh, riots and violence, there was a scaling up of what's known as the Partner Assistance Program, uh, and this was quite interesting. This paired cities and counties in southern in, in, in Xinjiang with the uh, richer cities and provinces of, uh, of eastern China. And they were told to lend expertise as well as a small percentage of their own revenues to developing Xinjiang. Um, so it was project-based. They tended to replicate the models they knew, building industrial parks, commercial free trade zones, you know, Shenzhen, imagine Shenzhen's development, trying to transfer that to Kashgar, right? And that's what was sort of done. Um, some of it worked, some of, some of it, it didn't. Um, now, as we can talk about later, it's had the result of tightly linking those provinces and cities with everything going on in Xinjiang right now. And many of those factories that were built under this program are the very factories where Uyghurs are being moved from the camps to work right now. Likewise, they, they were responsible, the eastern provinces and cities were responsible for bringing in companies from their own regions. So those Chinese firms have been entangled in this as well. I just want to quickly say a couple words about this institution of the Bingtuan uh, or the um, Xinjiang Jianshi Shengchang Bingtuan. Um, uh, so, when the, um, when, the, when the CCP won in its, went in its civil war against the Guomindang, uh, there was an army of some 80,000 Guomindang soldiers uh, pushed back out into Xinjiang. Um, and Chiang Kai-shek told them to fight to the very last man. And they said, well, no, I don't think so. So the generals escaped over the passes into India and got around to Taiwan. The soldiers were, were stuck there. Uh, and so they were settled on the land as a kind of uh, a, a, a resurrection of the old Han Dynasty uh, Twin Tian kind of system um, as, militia far as militia farmers as in building state farms. And they have a strong ideological connection with the region, which is uh, constantly uh, evoked. Um, but they were meant to settle and control and, and manage security. And they were very explicit about this. The idea was you know, one hand on the pickaxe, one hand on the gun is part of their uh, ideology. And just a couple of weeks ago, Xi Jinping, speaking at a Xinjiang work forum, uh, highlighted the need, he's still behind the Bingtuan, so highlighted the need to strengthen its advantages so it can achieve its special function without being too clear what that function was. Uh, it gets huge subsidies, 80 to 90% of the Bingtuan budget supporting uh, almost probably about 3 million people now, comes directly from Beijing. Okay. They, um, although they have, the Bingtuan has a network of global corporations, uh, it's not able to, to support. I have uh, police cars running by and all sorts of construction going on. I'm sorry if I get a little distracted by that. Um, uh, so it, it, it's not a profitable 
organization, despite the fact that they have huge tracts of land, that they grow tons of very high quality cotton, that they have hundreds of thousands of shell companies all around the world. And they've late, lately come into the crosshairs of the US government. Um, the Bing Tuan's Public Security Bureau has been put on the uh, US entity list, um, which is a, basically a naming and shaming uh, process. They've been sanctioned, some of the officials have been sanctioned for, through Global Magnitsky, um, a, a huge multi-billion dollar clothing company, the Eskel Group, which provides uh, clothing for many, many internationally known fashion brands. They had a, a joint partnership with the Bing Tuan. They too have been put on the entities list and they're not happy about that at all. Um, so in any case, we see sort of what's um, that you know this, this central organization uh, is very much part of development of the region, um, but the Bing Tuan also uh, has re runs prisons. It ran labor reform prisons, and it's now running these camps. And so this marriage of development and security functions is is crystallized really in this massive um, colonial settler organization of the Bing Tuan. All right, the, the, the People's Republic of China, like the Soviet Union, suffered an image problem in that they inherited an empire, both you know, the Tsarist Empire and the, and the Qing Empire. But of course, as socialist parties, as communist parties, they were dedicated to the opposition to imperialism. So what do you do about that? Uh, there were initially, I think, quite enlightened policies and approaches to defeat great Russian chauvinism to, to defeat great Han chauvinism. In, in, the, in, in China, in the PRC, uh, this took the, the form that, again, every, anyone who knows anything about China will recognize of um, identifying 56 ethnic groups or nationalities known as Minzu, uh, creating autonomous regions for some of them, including Uyghurs, Tibetans, uh, 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 Mongols, and others. Uh, and I would like to simply point out that special economic zones and even the idea of one country, two systems are in a way related to this, what I call centralized pluralism of the PRC. Um, in other words, a, an approach which is really quite creative in allocating sovereignty and allocating legal systems differentially in different territories for different peoples, um, as opposed to having, you know, formally one system supposedly governing uh, everywhere. So it's creative, it's not liberal in the Western sense, but it's a way of dealing with cultural pluralism, with uh, practical problems at frontiers for trade and other things like that. The Minzu system in the 50s and the 1980s was relatively successful. The 80s are looked back on by many non-Han groups in China as a golden age, uh, but always treated the, you know, I'm, I'm using the word natives here for Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other non-Han peoples in Xinjiang. Um, they were always somewhat different, right? So the, the kind of you know, student demonstrations in the 1980s then, just to take one example, um, for which there was latitude for Han students up until June of 1989, when there wasn't latitude, but uh, there wasn't so much wiggle room for Uyghurs. They, there was always a sense that this was a separatist movement, even if people were complaining about things as mundane as food in their dormitories, that kind of thing. Uh, in the 1990s, there were a series um, of um, violent incidents, marches that uh, turned uh, that turned bad. Um, I can enumerate those if we want to later on. Uh, after in 2001, after 9-11, uh, something happened that was really of great moment for how we look at the entire, uh, the entire issue here. And I'm, I'll just sort of go through this because it's really important, but it's, it's almost completely unknown. Uh, the Bush administration listed the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement uh, as a terrorist organization. And they did this in order to get PRC support for the resolution for the war in Iraq. Now, where did they find out about this? Well. The PRC had, PRC had released a white paper in 2000, early 2002, so a few months after 9-11. Uh, and this paper cataloged a long list of 
what they call terrorist acts. Um, there were a couple bombings. Most of them were actually um, murders or assassinations of individual people um, with some statistics about how many people had died uh, in, these, uh, in, in these acts. They didn't actually give all the acts that added up to all the number of people. In that same document, they had an alphabet soup of different groups, which they called terrorist groups. What the document notably didn't do was associate acts with groups. Okay, there was a list of, list of acts and a list of groups. Now, when the US decided to list this one group, this was a group that had a small operation in Afghanistan. It might have had some ties to Al Qaeda. Uh, it had not done anything in Xinjiang, and the, and the white paper, the PRC white paper, didn't say that it had done anything in Xinjiang or done anything at all. It simply said that it existed and might have ties to Al Qaeda. What the US did, though, was take the, the language from the PRC white paper of all of these acts and attribute them all to the East Turkestan Islamic movement. So we went well beyond what the PRC propaganda itself did and created this notion of an organized group, inter international, operating in Xinjiang that had done all of these specific things. Um, and then after that, the think tanks took over in what Sean Roberts call, calls the, um, the terrorism industrial complex and really ginned up this whole idea um, and of course, for about 10 years, uh, or well, for several years during that time, up until the Olympics, uh, the region was, was quiet. Um, all right, I'm realizing I'm, I'm using up a lot of time here, so I don't wanna go on uh, too, much, too much further. Let me see if I can just quickly uh, reach an end. Um, so over the, the last few years, you know, since around 2014, We've seen a shift from these earlier Minzu policies. Xi Jinping moved ethnic affairs and religious affairs from the government into the party um, in, a, in a centralizing move, which he's done you know, with many functions of the party of the party state. There's been a discussion about changing the earlier Minzu uh, Minzu policies um, going on, and although the form of them has not been formally changed. Um, you know, for example, there's been no dropping of the so-called Uyghur, the, the, the uh, autonomous region uh, idea, the territorialization of, of ethnicity like this. At the same time, the content, the spirit has changed, has changed greatly. There's been a sinicization of religion campaign um, and other things we've talked about before. Um, so clearly a move towards a, a much more assimilationist approach, which has echoes even for other groups as well, particularly for Tibetans, but even for other groups in China, um, not only for the Uyghurs, of course, it's much more acute for the, for the Uyghurs. Uh, all right, so what's been going on now then, I say, is abandonment of centralized pluralism uh, in favor of uh, a much more assimilation, assimilationist approach. Uh, just two weeks ago, Xi Jinping was giving a speech at the Xinjiang Work Forum um, and he actually said that uh, he used a racialized way of talking about this um, and saying that you know, the, 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 F, the Minzu of Xinjiang are family members linked to Chinese bloodlines, so Xue um, There's been a similar argument that the Uyghurs are not related to the Central Asian Turks. They've just, they're only related to the Zhonghua uh, Minzu. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just leave that up there um, for a moment, and, I, and I'll you know, wrap it up um, right now. Okay, great. Well, well thanks uh, very much for that informative, uh, sobering presentation. Uh, I believe Bill Hurst has to leave before we finish. So, Bill, why don't you, you know, ask the first question or two? Wow. Um... Thanks for putting me on the spot there, Peter. Uh, I am happy to ask a couple of questions though, and I don't know what would actually be the most useful uh, for all of our audience, but one question that I have uh, for Jim is looking forward from our current situation uh, in Xinjiang uh, with the Chinese government talking about uh, graduation from the camps, uh, trying to put a more positive or at least uh, less uh, 
negative appearance uh, on this, uh, more positive spin. Uh, is there an end point, do you think, uh, or a point of inflection in the trajectory of policies that the Chinese government's been taken, taking other than essentially a complete destruction of the Uyghur community in Xinjiang? Is there, is there something that we might see short of that uh, where the Chinese government would likely change tack, perhaps at the 20th Party Congress uh, that's mm. coming up in, in about two years' time? So the official explanation for what is going on is that you know, this is a vocational training program, a mass vocational training program meant to, uh, to, to cure people of extremist thinking um, and, and, uh, through, through training and by giving people jobs uh, you know, in, 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 in factories. Um, so the, the official narrative itself does actually define a trajectory. You know, this training happens, um, and even in some of the release documents that, you know, this, that have leaked out, um, there was talk about you know, the, 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 cent the, the period of time spent in educational transformation should be a year, a year and a half. Then there would be further real vocational training after that. You know, so, so, so that official line actually you know, does imply an endpoint, um, or at least a, a process. Um, and you know, I think that unfortunately, the, the official line is talking only about one small aspect of this. It's not talking about the. Um, you know, they don't talk about moving children into boarding schools. They don't talk about repressing births and so on. So, so I really do think that um, you know, there is a much stronger. Uh, and, and someone in the Q and A said assimilation is, is a euphemism. So you know, ethnocidal, genocidal. I you know whether that's built into the initial blueprint of this or whether that's um, an effect that people don't realize they're doing, I don't know. But um, that, that is the broader thrust of what's been going on. Um, there, there's, a, there's debate about whether the few sanctions that, for example, the United States has, has implemented so far uh, are having any bite. Um, and of course, there's a lot of concern about whether other countries will follow who follow through, whether countries that are hoping to be recipients of Belt and Road investment would um, be willing to say anything about this. Uh, I've looked a bit into the, the question of cotton, um, of, of textile industry in Xinjiang. I didn't get to it just now, but um, this is a very big liability for, for China. Uh, they have, over the past couple of decades, moved cotton growing and increasingly cotton processing from eastern parts of China almost exclusively to Xinjiang. 80% of, of Xinjiang's raw cotton, of China's raw cotton is now grown in Xinjiang. Um, not by Uyghurs so much, a lot by the Bingtuan and so on. Um, uh, but the involvement of all of the, of the Bingtuan and of all of Xinjiang local authorities with this gulag of camps and prisons means that pretty much any economic activity, even if there aren't Uyghurs in that factory, the people running that factory are directly associated with this overall system. And that tainting has begun to trickle down the supply chains. Um, and, you know, Chinese firms are going to be hesitant to be involved. Western firms don't want anything to do with anything that can reach them back to, to Xinjiang. So um, the, the development model, which China has been behind and has been pushing in Xinjiang, will not will not work, um, or certainly will not work as they're expecting. They can't move low value added labor, uh, uh, factory work, you know, textiles and uh, electronic assembly, um, you know, following this process of, of chasing cheap labor inland, 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 which has been going on for decades. Xinjiang's the last place, right? That's clearly been the, the plan. They've messed that up by sullying it with all of this. So that's not going to work. Um, so I think, you know, my, my hope is that it will be a declare victory and go home kind of thing where they'll unwind some of this. They won't step down and admit to having done anything, you know, admit to genocide. Um, but I hope the CCP tries to back off from some of these policies, realizing that they're not, 
possible in the global setting. Great, thank you very much. I actually have two other very quick questions and I apologize if I may have to actually step out uh, before you're done answering them because I do have to run in about four minutes. Uh, but the first is actually following on something you just said about the Belt and Road policies uh, and springing off of another aspect of, of Xinjiang's history uh, as an important node of communications, trade, transport and everything else in Central Asia, as well as linking China with Central Asia. It is similarly, one would think, and in fact, according to all reports, is a really central link uh, or node of the road part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So it would seem that any countries hoping to participate or already participating in that initiative with China are tied into the situation in Xinjiang in a lot of important ways, uh, economic uh, and technical, as well as social and political. Uh, and so I wonder if you could speak to some of the implications of that. Mm -hmm. The second very quick question is, there have been a lot of reports and some increased attention recently to changes in policy and the management of other autonomous regions, uh, notably Inner Mongolia, uh, but we've been hearing some things also about Tibet uh, and even about uh, Guangxi and Ningxia uh, in, mm -hmm. in some uh, recent months. And so I wonder if you could speak to that and to what extent is that influenced directly by the situation in Xinjiang or by the policies that the CCP has adopted there? And to what extent is that really a separate phenomenon or set of phenomena uh, in each of these places? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So on the Belt and Road and Central Asia question, um, one of the arguments that people would often say when we first were, were uh, finding out what was going in Xinjiang, um, and by people here, I guess I mean um, maybe some of my Chinese colleagues, um, educated, well-thinking people who would say, uh, oh, well, you know, Xinjiang needs to be stable because of the Belt and Road. And not simply Chinese colleagues. I mean, one heard that quite a bit, and that's why they're doing this, right? Um, and, um, and there's several problems with that. One, Xinjiang wasn't really unstable in the way that is claimed. Uh, secondly, I think, and more importantly, and relative, relevant to your question, is you know, um, the Belt and Road is not a road, <laughs> right? It doesn't start. The Silk Road wasn't a road either, but it it doesn't start here and run through. You know, yes, there are roads, there are rails, there's all sorts of things, um, but it really is a brand. A, a brand name for a wide variety of enterprises, many which began before 2013 when the idea was, was announced. Um, public, private, public, private, right? It's, it's a complex set of, of different things. Um, it also, again, tends to skip over the southern part of Xinjiang, which is what's particularly in the crosshairs of these, of these policies. Um, and maybe even turns Uyghur, uh, densely Uyghur parts of the region into kind of flyover country for this, these Belt and Road operations. That's been indeed one of the problems. They've been sort of left out of these broader development ideas. Um, so, um, you know, obviously, you know, the, the Pakistan economic corridor is perhaps the most relevant here, um, not only because it does leave from Kashgar, uh, but also because Pakistan uh, importers and exporters and businessmen uh, have been directly impacted by the internments of their wives. Many of them have Uyghur wives, right? So, so this this kind of and, and Pakistan at the governmental level, of course, has been has been shamefully uh, not just silent, but saying, "I see nothing, I, I hear nothing." Imran Khan has said as much. So, um, you know, I think it is associated, but 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 not in the way people tend to think when they have you know, a line on the map vision of the Belt and Road. It's, it's more a series of nodes and projects and so on and so forth. Um, as for broader policy changes regarding non-Han peoples in the PRC, I think they are very much linked. Um, the idea of educational transformation, was, which was so scaled up in Xinjiang, has been practiced in many places, and not only on minority peoples, actually, for, you know, um, Falun Gong was really, I think, the, the first victims of it. But um, 
but it, it's being reintroduced. Um, it, it probably began in this go around in Tibet before it was scaled up in Xinjiang, but it's now being scaled up to an extent in Tibet without as much of the carceral aspect to it. But the same idea that we need to turn farmers and herdsmen into wage laborers and factories as a approach to development. So we're seeing that. The Mongolian incidents recently of people being upset that that all Mongolian schools will no longer that, that, that Mongolian will not be will no longer be the primary language of instruction in in, in Mongolian schools. Uh, that is entirely uh, in of the same nature of the changes that have been going on in Xinjiang. And I actually think a lot of the reasons for such staunch resistance to it, you know, a, a school strike, not sending kids to schools, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, one reason for that is that um, people see these changes as the first of broader changes. And they know, even if they can't talk openly, what's going on uh, in Xinjiang. And so they're, they're worried about even losing two or three of your classes that used to be taught in Mongolia, now they're being taught in Han. Um, even that is, is, is scary because it's the camel's nose in, in the tent. Um, there's an interesting aspect to this, and I'm not, you know, um, I'm not a, uh, a scholar of, 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 the, CC, of the party uh, or of you know, party uh, um, you know, nomenclatura. Um, but it's very interesting that Xi Jinping's father, uh, was it Xi Jongrun? I think I, I maybe something like, I've forgotten his name. Is that it? Yeah. Um, looks like Bill's gonna tell me. Xi Jong, Jongshun, thank you, right. I, um, you know, he was famously involved with the organization department um, I'm sorry, with the United Front, uh, working with particular Tibetan groups, um, but was known as someone who was sympathetic to traditional uh, you know, non-Han elites um, and, and, and friendly and, and was sort of welcomed by that. Um, so it's interesting that she has made such a big, Xi Jinping now has, has made uh, ethnic policies such a central aspect of the changes he's made. He's, he's done a lot of different things, but um, you know, in particular, this issue of Mongolia right now, why do that now when the entire world is accusing China of ethnocide in Xinjiang? Why choose this moment after decades? You know, it, it could be done at some other point. And I think that this, that and the sinicization of religion campaign um, uh, and, and you know, attention to Zhonghua Minzu and redefinition of that, I think that this is a central, uh, this is a goal for Xi Jinping, um, you know, even above the particular local policy goals and reasons given for changing ethnic policy in Xinjiang, say, or Tibet. I think it's a broader goal to, uh, I suppose, as part of a you know, national China dream kind of ideology to create a more uniform image of Chineseness. Um, that's my speculation. Well, I wonder if I could um, pick up on the question of, of the cynicization of religion, you know, which you just um, mentioned. Um, that again, this is something, you know, which is happening, has been happening um, throughout all of China, um, but it has in some ways been most arresting, you know, in um, Xinjiang. So I'm just um, sharing um, a slide now just showing um, a, a shrine and such shrines, um, you know, have for a long time been a common, you know, presence, you know, in um, Xinjiang. Um, but many of them, including, you know, rather famous ones such as this, you know, have been um, disappearing. And, and so here we have, you know, an image from 2011, you know, compared with um, June 2020. Uh, which, as you can see, um, much the, the the footprint effectively, you know, of this um, shrine, you know, has you know been erased. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit um, about um, this campaign overall, which seems to certainly have focused uh, very much on Islam in particular. Uh, I mean, I would say Islam and Christianity, as if you will, you know, foreign religions have very much you know been in the party's sights. Uh, and you did mention certainly um, domes and also crescents, which would be at the top of mosques, have disappeared. 
the destruction of mosques. And you know, very recently, uh, I think it was last week in the Asahi Shimbun, um, there was a report of how throughout China, certainly in Xinjiang, but even let's say in Beijing, mosques which had largely been used by Uyghurs, you know, have been you know transformed. Um, in the minds of some, perhaps desecrated, you know, to become, you know, restaurants or even bars, um, and and so this erasure of, you know, Islam in particular, and also of kind of architecture and culture, you know, I mean, certainly throughout Xinjiang, um, and and just very much on the ground, how this is changing. I mean, um, could you talk about the significance of such? sites and such shrines perhaps you know in Uyghur culture and how people have been thinking about this yeah um, well there's an interesting contradiction between the, the the attacks on domes are nominally uh part of a the de-arabization of islam and, and you know scientization of islam but de-arab you know it, uh, right um what it's called and somebody decided that a dome um, is is an Arabic feature. Um, I mean, actually, you know, insofar as there are there are domes for all sorts of reasons, depending on when the you know, the mosque was built in 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 PRC territory. But um, you know, the older ones certainly are following Central Asian uh, models, which are um, you know not Saudi propaganda or anything like that. In any case, it's been decided that those things are are, are problematic because they're supposedly Arabic. Now the shrines, which which Peter just just showed, and of course there are many of them, from tiny little ones to very large, elaborate ones. Um, you know, these are these are Sufi shrines. They're the uh, this uh, site commemorating the um, usually the death of a sheikh um, of a of a um, charismatic religious uh, teacher. Uh, in the past, some of them are also dedicated to you know, characters from the from the Shahnama, the Persian Book of Kings. Um, they have various kind of cultural reference points like this, but um, uh, they are the most important ones. Are pilgrimage sites, uh, and in fact, collectively, in the southern part of Xinjiang, a region known as Altashar, the six cities, collectively these these shrines. Um, create a, a, a pilgrimage circuit, which people in the 18th, 19th, early 20th century used to take, uh, and which locally it was actually believed that if you did that, it was okay. You didn't need to go on Hajj to Mecca, um, but this was a, a, an acceptable substitute within uh, Uyghur Islam for the Hajj. Um, so it's really ironic that the Chinese Communist Party should be singling out what is in fact uh, completely local expression of Islam, right? I mean, in Xinjiang territory itself, local practice, um, and, that, and that, that even, uh, you know, can stand in for the Hajj, which they're of course also very concerned about people taking. Um, and, and, it, and it's exactly the opposite of this you know, Arabization that they're so worried about, because of course, within um, the you know, sort of Wahhabi version of, of Sunni Islam uh, in, the, in the Arab world, or particularly Saudi Arabia, you know, shrines of any sort are anathema, right? They're seen as um, idolatry and so on. So this is very much a local Central Asian expression of of Islam, which is simultaneously being targeted as a, as a supposedly foreign one. So it shows they're not really thinking about this that, that closely. This is not an ethnographically informed policy. It's simply, they're, they're worried about these, I guess, as points of congregation or something like this. I mean, notably, I don't know of any cases where, you know, shrines became uh, the, the center of, of resistance organization or anything like that either. It's just part of this excessive overreaction to anything that looks Islamic and frankly things that are just different from um, what is seen as the Han Chinese norm you know and therefore scary therefore frightening um, so yeah and and many of them you know I'm sure many people here know Ryan Thumb's book um, uh, the sacred shrines of Uyghur culture I believe it's called which won 
I believe, um, the AAS prize and the AHA prize and the anthropology prize, or some three prizes in the Central Asia Prize when it came out. It's a marvelous, marvelous, uh, marvelous book about these shrines and associated stories. Okay, great. So um, a, a different question, um, which is, I wonder if you could talk a bit perhaps about the role of the state and also state media in, in um, you know, stirring up the received opinion that Uyghurs are perhaps, you know, suspicious or connected with terrorism. Um, as you mentioned, of course, uh, you know, for a long period, you know, Xinjiang was quiet per se, uh, but of course there have been a few events which certainly play a key role in narratives, whether within China itself or you know, outside, uh, particularly let's say the unrest in 2008, which was in response to you know, the death of a man in police custody, uh, and then the 2009 Urumqi riots, um, and then of course the 2014 uh, Kunming attack, a knife attack, you know, which led to the deaths of some like three dozen people. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, Xinjiang, you know, and I think within China and, and without, I mean, there are many people who do falsely equate, you know, Uyghurs with terrorism. So how has this come about? Right. So I think, um, since 2000, and th there have been various points, but this is why I actually use the term you know, colonial problem. Um, there has been unrest in the region. Some of that unrest has been violent. Uh, and then a really quite narrow subset of that violent unrest is what I think most Western observers or you know, outside observers would call terrorism. Okay, so why am I you know, splitting hairs on this? When I say terrorism, I mean um, random attack, attacks on random civilians. Um, and um, of those, there were a couple bus bombings about which we know very, very little in uh, 1992, 1997. Uh, there were uh, four incidents in, in 2013 and 2000, and let's share screen again here. Right, so for, um, 2013, 2014, including the Quinming, um, but also an Arumchi market attack, um, and so on. And, and these, I would admit, are terrorism, and you know, Sean Roberts and his, his work, he talks about this uh, and others. Um, the, the, the other kinds of unrest, are, you know, there's all sorts of things. There, there are, have been um, you know, protests that, that get violent when they're repressed. Um, there have been a lot of things of, that seem to have been sparked by police activity, so house-to-house -house searches or police chasing down groups, um, apprehending groups in the mountains. Um, and these, of course, are invariably reported as police uh, you know, unearthed a terrorist cell uh, in the mountains, right? Um, and then you read a little bit more about it, and this terrorist cell includes equal numbers of men and women and children, um, and they're interrupted while, while praying. And so you don't quite know what to know about that. Or there seem to be you know, uh, farmers attacking offices, police offices, for example. Um, and then the reports will come out, um, you know, um, police killed, uh, you know, seven police died in a conflict with you know, 280 terrorists, you know, and, and a whole bunch of terrorists were killed and the rest were, were arrested and so on. So, you know, it, this doesn't fit the model of a you know of an organized terrorist attack. Also, there have not been any uh, no international coordination, no broader organization linking up any one of these acts with other acts. Uh, they seem to be you know, even the Quinming events, which had you know nine people perpetrating them. Um, they don't seem to be at least as far as we know broader organization. So, um, so the actual terrorism, which you know did happen in those years is actually just a small part of a much broader problem. And that broader problem is, is, um, is, is unrest, it's resistance to 
the system by certain people. It's, it's sporadic. Um, and I would argue that you know, what needs to be done is you need to diagnose this problem properly to understand why the farmers are marching against the police station. Uh, rather than simply saying, oh, they're Muslims, they must be extremists, they must be terrorists, um, and, and, and so on. And, and likewise, you know, the, much that is simply ethno-national identity is now called separatist, which is treated as a mortal, as a mortal sin. Um, and you know, it, 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 misdiagnosis is, is, a, is a lot of that. And then I mean, it's, it's kind of, well, it's not really unfair, but it's, it's uh, you know, one, one should point out as a, uh, the number of so-called mass incidents in the rest of China. Now, not all of those are violent. Many of those are simply uh, you know, demonstrations. And we don't know what those tens of thousands always uh, mean. Um, but some of them, you know, involve a whole village rebelling, you know, taking the mayor hostage, uh, shutting down a factory, not allowing authorities. You know, there are some quite uh, notable examples of unrest in other parts of China over the last several years, um, which of course are not called terrorism. Um, the reasons for those, you know, environmental depredations, theft of pension funds, um, uh, uh, steal, taking of land by authorities, um, sometimes related to family planning policies, right? All of those things happen in Xinjiang as well. But the escape valve of the the mass incident, where the local, which is a is a is a is a means of notifying the central government that things are going wrong on the local level, and then the central the party comes in, sorts it out, uh, is able to kind of you know, bathe itself in glory for resolving the problem, and while cashiering or maybe even executing you know local officials, you know, that's that's the way in which these things are mediated and have been. Um, um, quite successfully, I suppose, in, in a non-democratic uh, authoritarian system in the rest of China without a free press, right? But in Xinjiang, that escape valve doesn't exist. Everything is terrorism and there's you know, one crackdown uh, on it. And that's the issue. And then I you know, point out in June 13, um, you know, a man set fire to a bus in Fujian and killed 46 people. That's more people than died in Kunming. You know, and we don't call that terrorism. So, um, you know, sometimes these, these comparisons can be invidious, but um, the blanket use of this concept of terrorism, I think, doesn't actually serve Chinese state interests well either, because it's a misdiagnosis of what's, what's going on, and therefore their prescriptions of solutions are also off. Um, yeah, I can, let me say something about Urumqi as well, because there's a, there's a big misunderstanding about um, the events of 2009 uh, in, in Urumqi. Um, these are, of course, the, the, it's, it's known as the 7-5 incident, the July 5th incident, uh, and it was very highly publicized in the PRC with a uh, gruesome video of burning buses and of uh, Han people bleeding in the streets of Urumqi. Uh, and it's called the Urumqi you know, riots. Uh, initially, it was called the Terrorist uh, Act as well and blamed on Rabia Qadir, a, a former Uyghur businesswoman who now lives in Washington, DC. Um, but the broader story of this, it's not just July 5th. It began several days earlier with uh, what could be called a lynching in a factory in Guangdong. And it was, a, it was a false accusation that Uyghurs had attacked a Han woman. Uh, and then Han men from one factory dormitory attacked the Uyghurs in the other factory dormitory and beat at least two of them to death. And then the authorities tried to cover it up, but the news spread very rapidly along with video footage of the beating itself on the internet. And people obviously were very concerned. Uyghurs internationally were concerned and Uyghurs in Xinjiang were concerned. A march was organized uh, with about a thousand people, and they marched to the uh, People's Square in Urumqi, the main square, uh, waving Chinese flags, singing the Chinese national anthem as they marched to display that, that this was loyal concern. They wanted the legal system to adequately deal with this issue. Um, 
that demonstration, um, unlike the Tiananmen de demonstrations in 89, unlike even the Hong Kong demonstrations that we've seen recently, that demonstration was repressed with lethal force right away. There was no uh, you know, time lag. There was no period of time. There was no use of non-lethal. You know, there was shooting uh, and, and, and violent repression right away. And the riots broke out. So although we don't know everything that went on, um, that's the context in which to understand this. And of course, when we're told, when, when we talk about July 5th, uh, and the events of that night, and I have you know, a long description of this in an article I wrote, and it's in my new, my, my new chapter. Um, you know, we're not told about the uh, vigilante activity over the next few days of mainly Han attacks on, on Uyghurs, um, which killed numbers of people, but we don't know how many, um, or the arrest of thousands of Uyghurs that followed. So it's, it's a sequence of events a whole episode, not simply the one, uh, the one rioting, which is not to excuse the violence of that rioting, but we need to, again, put it in this context, the broader context of un unrest and problems of how the system is stacked against Uyghur uh, people and increasingly, and particularly after that, that point in 2009, um, revealed itself as supporting Han against Uyghur. Okay, well, I'd also just like to um, encourage those of you who are watching that if you do have questions, again, please do submit them to the Q&A tab at the bottom. I've gotten, you know, several questions. So um, I'll, I'll try and actually take some questions from um, the audience uh, along with my own interest really in um, foreign responses. I mean, how is maybe the Chinese state responding to this? I mean, it is notable that just the other day, right, the Canadian Parliament Common Subcommittee on International Rights, right, issued a report, you know, um, which labeled um, recent events in uh, Xinjiang, you know, genocide, you know, this predictably brought, uh, you know, paroxysms of rage, you know, from Zhao Lijian, the um, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson, um, you know, so, how would you characterize um, the response of the world in particular, but also in particular, how would you maybe explain the relative silence, uh, particularly of the global Luma, of you know, the global you know, Muslim um, community you know, to this? Uh, and then as a related part of you know, this general topic is you know, given really the particular role or indeed responsibility, um, blame, you know, that the United States, you know, has, you know, in the creation of this, um, you know, given, uh, I mean, as you already discussed, um, you know, following 9-11 and the U.S. declared global war on terror, you know, how um, the United States, uh, you know, shifted the way it itself, you know, was, you know, thinking about um, ETIM. Um, what avenues should perhaps people in the US in particular press on this? Also given the fact, of course, that many American, you know, corporations um, are certainly, you know, as one person put it, uh, saving costs by using Uyghur forced labor. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's several elements of your question. Um, I guess on, you know, why hasn't the world done more or what should the world do or in you know, US role and so on? Um, uh, it was unfortunate that this uh, corresponded with the you know, beginnings of the Trump administration um, because the, uh, the uh, schizophrenia of the, of the Trump government with regard to China, um, you know, kind of created a gap into which this issue fell for over a year. Um, and by schizophrenia, I mean, you know, on, on the one hand, there were the kind of the, the internationalists, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who wanted to continue commercial engagement, at least, you know, uh, with China. And then there were the Uber hawks who wanted to decouple. Um, and they were kind of struggling it out within the administration for some time. And of course, you know, coronavirus was the tipping point, which then swung Trump into full on China bashing mode. Um, you know, although he kept his bank account, <laughs> right? So, um, 
So, so what happened there, and um, with the U.S. You know, um, you know, withdrawal or relative withdrawal from a lot of international fora, um, kind of you know, pulling back or you know, strange engagement with in, in, in East Asia, uh, uh, deep sixing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, and then in particular withdrawing from the UN Human Rights Council, which would which is the body where this would be discussed. The U.S. was no was AWOL from that, right? Um, so that quiescence on the part of the U.S. let this rise, you know, pulled the U.S., which should have had a leading voice about this, you know, out of the conversation for a good year and a half, two years, right? Now, meanwhile, civil society and journalists all around the world were reporting it, um, you know, a handful of academics who knew enough about it to, to begin with reporting it. There was tons of information coming from Uyghurs themselves, whose family members had disappeared, had deleted them. Um, the 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 uh, the source base for all of this is is really very very large, and there's I know there's a narrative coming around from certain sources um, that we don't have much evidence of this that it's scattered that it's based only on a couple think tank reports. That's just not true. Um, just look it up: New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, The Guardian, uh, Le Monde, um, BBC. They sent people there, they reported on it, they showed pictures of it. And then lots of independent people such as uh, Sean Zhang, a law student from University of British Columbia, who made a, a, you know, a, his own kind of, ha well, hobby is the wrong word for it, maybe, uh, but a, um, a project of finding these camps and verifying them with satellite data and publishing them on Medium along with their coordinates so the journalists could then go to those sites on the ground, which they often did. So we have verification from satellite and on the ground for a lot of these things. Anyway, that's just, there was a question in the Q&A about the source base for this. Um, so anyway, I think some of the delay at the governmental level and international level was, was due to the Trump administration. I think we would have seen under any other, be it Republican or Democratic administration, a much more uh, vocal response from the U.S. early on. Now, the U.S. absence then, um, you know, it, it left certain other, it, it, we didn't provide any cover for other countries. Turkey, quite early on, actually, uh, after the, what was seen, what was thought to be the death of a very beloved Uyghur musician, someone known in Iran, someone known in Turkey as well, uh, in the camps, the Turkish foreign minister made a very strong statement um, to stop this, this policies. It later turned out that the Chinese released a proof of life video that, that this man had not died. He'd simply been incarcerated for no reason. Um, you know, and that, I think, embarrassed the Turks a little bit and they had a, you know, a difficult situation there. And of course, um, well, we get into Turkish foreign policy and its relations with the US and China and Russia and so on and so forth, it's a complicated matter. But the US was not there to back those up. Um, as for you know, Muslim majority countries more generally, um, I, th you know, th this is a, a legitimate thing to say, a legitimate concern. Um, you know, everyone thinks back about you know, Salman Rushdie or the Danish cartoons and, you know, what seemed to be universal, uh, outcries from the entire Muslim world. Um, but I think it's just worth remembering that the idea of the Muslim world you know, is itself a construct. For political reasons, it was safe enough and, you know, deemed a good thing for, uh, to, to complain about Salman Rushdie and, and this cartoon and so on. We could, you know, I, not, I don't think it was, but, you know, that was okay. Uh, obviously, much less expedient to go up against China. But should we necessarily expect the Muslim world to speak with one voice about these things? You know, Uyghurs are not Arabs. Um, many people don't know where this is. So I think, you know, to a certain extent, that expectation is somewhat, um, the assumptions behind it are perhaps just a little um, uh, ill-informed, I suppose. Not, Peter, I don't mean to say that you're ill-informed for voicing that question, but, um, right, so, you know, that said, one would have expected more, and I think the, the conclusion which many people leap to is that um, many countries don't want to uh, jeopardize their relationships with China. I think that is a that is a true one. Um, 
you know, economic and, and, and otherwise. And, and the Belt and Road as a diplomatic initiative and a commercial initiative um, has arguably been very successful for China uh, in that regard. Um, now, interestingly, uh, there was a letter written by 22 European countries plus Japan and Australia, I believe, in the UN Human Rights Council um, decrying the internments and calling for an investigation. Um, and, th and that you know, letter was submitted through the UN Human Rights Council. Um, it was immediately met with a response from 37 other countries, uh, which adopted Chinese language and said, no, nothing's going on. It's an anti-terrorism measure and everything's fine. So, so this shows how the US absence from the UN Human Rights Council is, is obviously important. Now, if the, the common denominator though of, that, of those 37 countries was not that they were um, Islamic. It was not even that they were in the immediate Chinese neighborhood. Uh, it's that they are all very, very low on anybody's list um, of, of human rights violators. In other words, they are the, they're among the worst human rights violators. And that you know, various organizations come up with these lists, but these countries are all pretty much on the bottom of that, right? So the issue of um, you know, the glass houses not throwing stones issue is important here as well. Saudi Arabia has its own issues. They're not going to be uh, you know, running against sort of China's treatment of, of, of minorities as well. So all of these things are there. And it simply speaks um, you know, to the need, I think. You know, it's not that the US should be the world leader about everything, but its absence has certainly been, been noticed in this regard. But I, I'll say one more thing though. I think that um, you know, the, the fourth estate, so, you know, journalism has been doing an admirable job. Mm -hmm. um, civil society, um, you know, young people have caught, have, have caught on to this. Uh, there was a very famous TikTok video that then spread on Twitter of a young woman, Feroza Aziz, uh, pretending to be curling her eyelashes and meanwhile, explaining what was going on. Um, and that went you know, very, very viral. Um, I, the, the Disney issue recently becoming, a Mulan movie becoming a scandal because they filmed a very small amount of the movie in, in Xinjiang. Uh, some friends of ours said that they were going to watch it and their um, eight-year-old daughter said, no, we can't watch Mulan because of the Uyghurs, right? Yeah. So, so, so popular knowledge about this has you know, really, really, really spread. Um, and this speaks, I think, to the question of what to do. Um, I think targeted, carefully, you know, surgical kinds of sanctions like the global Magnitsky sanctions, uh, like certain listings. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I think those are a good way to go. I think um, uh, financial forensics, both on, on the officials who are responsible for this, but also corporations who are connected, I think that's very important. And, and it would be great to see more of that from other countries as well and joining in, in, in US activities. Uh, I don't think that um, you know, decoupling from China will help the Uyghurs at all, the kinds of scorched earth policies that the Trump administration has been following, uh, nor will closing consulates because we, you know, nor will tit for tat kicking out of journalists because we lose information, we lose the ability to do this reporting. Um, and likewise, broad brush tariffs on billions of dollars worth of goods traded between the US and China, uh, that hurts all the wrong, wrong people. So, you know, we now actually have narrow, much more surgical tools at the governmental level, which I think could be very useful. And then civil society, broader level, um, pressure on, on firms is very important. Uh, you know, ask, you know, your name brands, those clothing, are you associated with Xinjiang or not? And, and you know, you can put pressure on them through, through Twitter and other fora like that. Um, and it gets heard. Um, and and um, these companies, they may, you know, they're not going to denounce, it. they're not going to speak up themselves. Um, but that message does filter through, up through supply chains and it gets to local authorities uh, and it begins to make things hot. And it, as I said before, it makes this whole system, I think, ultimately intenable. It's not as fast as we would like, but I think that's a, um, it is something that individuals can, can do. Okay. Well, let me just ask a, a, a question um, oh, from the Q&A, which is, what is the role of China specialists in academia in talking about this issue and increasing awareness 
and what is a misunderstood and under-discussed human rights crisis. What do we say to people who have concerns about losing access, that is research visas, are their concerns legitimate given we still want to maintain quality knowledge production on China? Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, the, Xinjiang, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to know, to learn about Xinjiang. Even if you're a China specialist, if you're teaching Chinese history, Chinese politics, and so on, it's a special subfield which requires you know, special, special knowledge. I'm not saying that to, to toot my own horn. I'm just saying that you know, it's not something that is well known by the entire cadre of, of sinologists, right? So, um, so a certain um, hesitancy to, to talk too much about it to journalists, you know, and or something like that. You know, I think that's understandable because we don't know about it. I, I often say no, I'm not going to talk about Tibet because I don't know enough about specifics of Tibet, right? So, so it is a very specialized kind of field. It has been. That said, the the field I think has been doing a really good job of of supporting um, the the spreading of information about what's going on with events precisely like this one today, and of course, individual scholars have learned up on it. Um, so, so let me say that. On the question of access, I haven't seen, uh, certainly, you know, there's a couple dozen sort of Xinjiang scholars generally and a handful of, you know, some most prominent ones, and no one is worried about that, you know, and, and, and hasn't been um, uh, for some time. I think, you know, there are broader questions about whether particularly American academics are going to be getting into China and having any access to archives and, and so on. You know, anyway, I think we're all um, we're all Xinjiang specialists now in that sense that you know the sensitivities are affecting us all. Um, but 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 that said, you know, for for several years I've been kind of you know I've been on on sort of a list, not exactly a blacklist, but a gray list, um, and I've you know gone to China periodically. I can't get a visa the way. Other people can, but I can get a visa by going through, you know, contacts or going through um, the embassy. Basically, I have to have a conversation with people, um, and um, you know, I think I do that. I think I can do that not because I um, am soft peddling the story about about Xinjiang um, or the Uyghurs, you know. Although I may have done some of that here and there, I don't think that's why. I think it's because at the same time. Uh, I'm also very willing to, for example, denounce the Trump administration. I mean, you know, I've been pro-engagement, although I will argue about what engagement should mean with regard to human rights and so on. But, you know, and I think most China scholars are in that, you know, are in that camp. Um, and at least in the Chinese foreign minister, well, I don't know, I, I don't wanna speak about the foreign minister, but, you know, that is recognized. And this is the kind of skill and Charybdis, which the, um, you know, academics who deal with China right now have to deal with, you know, on the one hand, we have to, you know, call out atrocities. On the other hand, we have to recognize that, you know, China bashing is being used for domestic political purposes by the Trump administration. Um, and that many of the policies, those targeting Chinese students, Chinese scholars saying that they're all spies, you know, these are just completely, uh, they're against everybody's interest and our interests as academics are against U.S. national interests and so on. So, you know, we have to call all those those things out. We have to thread that needle, um, which is which is you know, difficult, but that's the challenge we face right now. Okay. Well, essentially, we're we're out of time. Although, if, if you have something pithy, some final thought you'd like to leave us with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, please, you know, you have a minute or so. Let's say. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I guess, I mean, I, I had kind of come to that point with my last comments about you know, the mm -hmm. difficult situation that we're in right now um, as, let me expand it beyond, I don't, you know, China scholars or even beyond academe, just to people concerned about China, concerned about U.S.-China relations or Western Chinese relations. Um, and uh, you know, there are bad bad policies happening in many places, right? I think, um, you know, they, um, I, I'm very depressed the last few days about the news of, of 
that's separate that the 500 and some children separated from their parents at the U.S. southern border mm -hmm. um, that you know they can't find their parents, right? So um, you know the scale is different, but um, but children have been separated from their parents here as well by U.S. policies, and so you know, this is not a false equivalency, uh, and I don't think we should feel you know, guilty of what aboutism. If, if I denounce concentration right. camps in China, you know, often on Twitter I'll get you know what about yeah. the U.S. and so on. I don't speak for the U.S., but mm -hmm. I think for all of us, um, it's important to, to to call out these things, to think about you know, how how they should be. Um, to think and to, but but not simply to denounce one side or the other, um, but to recognize that you know that China is here and it is important and it has an awful lot to offer to to the world at this moment when we're you know, we're facing problems even bigger than the current pandemic, um, and that you know what is really the most urgent immediate question is how to get back on an even keel so that we can all cooperate um, so that we can support global diversity rather than trying to wipe it out. And so that we can work together against threats like climate change, um, mm -hmm. which is really the biggest ex existential threat that, that we face. I mean, an existential threat that we face. And we need to work together to, to, to deal with that. And a Cold War is not going to, you know, we can waste time with a Cold War while the planet burns. And that's not a good solution. Okay, well, on, on that, Kind of positive, rousing, hopeful note. Um, hopeful note about climate change. Right. We'll, we'll we'll take hope wherever we can find it. Um, you know, let's let's thank Professor Millward very much for an informative and, and, and stimulating conversation today. So many thanks. Thank you, everybody. Okay.